Kabbalah is the received wisdom of the Jews. Kabbalah is a perpetual background meditation upon the hierarchical structure of consciousness. Why submit yourself to this meditation? In order to upgrade your operating system until it becomes the perfect reflection of the universal consciousness. The Kabbalah is like the owner's manual of the human soul. And as no two people are alike, no two people operate their own soul alike. We've all got different things we have to learn. We're all at different stages of development and stuff. No, we've all got little different, different buttons that need to be pushed and stuff. The Kabbalah uh, teaches us how to work with our own set of of equipment. The whole idea of capitalistic thought is to achieve progressively higher levels of consciousness. When you do that, you get progressively healthier, you get progressively wiser, you get progressively funnier. You just start to turn into a real life human being, you start to realize your potential. We've got all of the equipment inside of us, in our minds and in our nervous system, to achieve these levels of consciousness. But most of us are just very happy just to be stupid. It has been a carefully preserved and jealously guarded science. The reasons for, for doing that are buried and unique. Okay? Maybe they're, they wanted to keep the knowledge from the, from the profane and such. I don't know what exactly was the reason for keeping it so secret and guarding it with such mystery. But the cat is out of the bag. The Kabbalistic cat is out of the bag now. In the last half of the 20th century, Kabbalah became a science of interest not only for, for Orthodox Jews, but also for Christians, atheists, people of all walks of life. Well, look at today, we've got Kabbalah centers, we've got Kabbalah books all over the place. We have, we have movie stars, women like Madonna uh, are studying the Kabbalah. And, and in the old days, of course, women couldn't study the Kabbalah. You had to be a man, you had to be over 40. You had to be rich enough to afford the leisure time to, to study this, this stuff. Now it's seen as a legitimate Western mysticism. And I like to, to say uh, Kabbalah is Western Eastern mysticism. Kabbalah is the Zen of the West because the goals are exactly the same. That's spiritual enlightenment and a union with the Supreme Deity. The Kabbalist just goes about it a little bit different than the Eastern mystic. The Eastern mystic gets real quiet and goes within and strips away all of these illusionary sensations and ego and all the things that we aren't until there's only just pure self left. And when that happens, bingo, something snaps inside. They go a little crazy in a, in a socially acceptable way. And all of a sudden there's no difference between um, the perceiver and what they're perceiving. Okay, they just become wall to wall. They hit this, uh, this emptiness, but it isn't emptiness. It's just wall to wallness, okay? The Kabbalists do exactly the same thing. Or, or shoot for that same goal, only they don't strip stuff away, they draw connections between that thing and that thing, and that thing and this thing, and this thing and that thing. They connect everything in the universe, because everything in the universe contains the pattern for everything else in the universe. Everything is the reflection of, every, of everything in the universe. And so the Kabbalists just start, so, well that's connected to this by means of these correspondences, and, and there's Kabbalistic techniques, real life, ways that you can you can play with the the thought of your own daily daily life it's a way of looking at things and sooner or later you're going to get to the point of where you actually find your own place in the universe and you'll have connected everything to everything else and all of a sudden 
you snap, you go crazy, and it's socially acceptable way, only you hit divine fullness. You've got that same wall to wallness, same level of consciousness, supreme uh, enlightenment that uh, Eastern mystics shoot for. Let's talk a little about yod heh vav -Hey, the great four-letter name of the of the Hebrews. It's an ineffable name. You're not supposed to say it. Okay, so when when uh, pious Jews run across the word, even in print, while they're reading the scripture, they say another word instead. They say Adonai, which means Lord. So when they see yod heh vav -Hey together, you don't say it. But it's ineffable for another reason, because technically it's a formula, not an anthropomorphic deity that we're talking about. And it's a formula that breaks absolutely everything in the universe. All energy, all matter, all forces, all levels of consciousness into four sections. Okay. yod heh vav -Hey is supposedly the one God. So, in a sense, it, there aren't four parts of anything. In a sense, in the ultimate sense, there's only one ultimate absolute thing. But it's represented in four sections, four descending sections, if you will. So, yod Hey vav Hey. The Kabbalists look at all the world as being broken up into four worlds that correspond to these four letters of this great name. And because we're made in the image of deity by tradition, our own souls are broken up into those same four categories, okay, that are just miniature reflections of that big fourfold division of, of the universe. Okay. So we got four Kabbalistic worlds, four parts of the soul. Things. But let's just kind of look at these four Kabbalistic worlds first of all. The very top one is called Atzalef, and it's called the archetypal world, and that's really the real world, okay? The other four worlds under it are just sort of expressions of it. It's like looking at all those other worlds with darker and darker sunglasses, really. But the second world is called Briya, and it's called the creative world. And the world underneath that is called Yetzira. And that's called the formative world. And the lowest world is Asaya, which is the material world that we're living in. Okay. And one is just kind of a reflection, a lower reflection of the other, all the way up to Axelith. Okay. To explain what these four worlds are about, uh, I, I use an example of, of a chair. Let's say that all four of these worlds are a four-story building and that everything in the universe, all the forces, all the energy, all the consciousness of the universe is in, represented as this four-story building. And we walk into the first floor and we see nothing but chairs. Chairs of every size and description. You got milking stools and you got lazy boys and you got couches and you love seats. And, and every chair in the world is on that first floor. Well, there is a section of that floor for absolutely everything that manifests in the material world. There's a tin can section of that floor. There's a small vibrating appliance section of that floor. There's a, there's a, there's a duck section of that floor. Okay? But just for this example, we're in the chair section. So it looks like a Wix furniture showroom of nothing but chairs. And we ask ourselves, where do these chairs come from? And we could say, well, the chairs come from wood and nails and upholstery and wool for the upholstery. But that's not true because there's a wool section, there's an upholstery section, there's a nail section, and it's all on the first floor. So the chair itself as an entity didn't come from the first floor at all. It came from the next floor up. And so we get in an elevator and we go one floor up from the ground floor and the elevator door opens and we, we don't see any chairs here, but we see uh, blueprints for chairs, like hanging from invisible wires all over the place. 
and uh, there's there's no uh, you know physical chairs, but there's there's these there's these forms of chairs because this is the formative world we're in, the Zyra. Okay? And if we want to use the imagery of the Kabbalists, we actually see people walking around, maybe in white lab coats. The people that drew these chairs, and uh, they've got pens and pocket protectors and pens, and they're kind of nerdy kind of people, because all they do is draw designs for these chairs. So in Kabbalistic parlance, these are angels. They're nerd angels, okay, up there in uh, uh, Yetzirah. And it's their job to set the pattern for all of those chairs to eventually manifest on that first floor. Okay. Can, can you sort of see it, it going from the specific, you know, to the general? Okay, where do these nerd angels get their orders? How do they know that they're supposed to be working on chairs? They get their marching orders from one floor up. So we get in an elevator again, we go one floor up, the elevator door opens, and we only see one angel behind a big desk. And this guy looks like Thomas Edison. He's the Thomas Edison of chairs. I don't know if you know, but Thomas Edison, you know, who invented everything in the entire 20th century, it seems like, uh, he would just get this idea in the morning. He'd get this very strange idea, and uh, he'd scribble something down on, a, on an envelope or a piece of paper, just something you could hardly read. And um, he would call up like one of his nerd angels from who worked for him, one of his engineers, and he would explain to them, you know, this. Um, uh, you know how something makes a, a vibrating sound when you rub it, you know, well, I want to yeah, make something that rubs on something else and maybe maybe uh, uh, run that impulse down this wire to a, that diaphragm that we stole from Alexander Graham Bell and uh, figure out a way to run it to another thing so it, it makes something wiggle and scratches another thing and then rerun it back down another another thing and until and til it comes out this big cone. I mean, literally, he would make such broad, sweeping generalities, but he'll say, it's a phonograph, I need it in two weeks. And then that nerd angel who couldn't think of that big plan, okay, goes and takes that big plan, that, that inspiration, and, and goes ahead and builds, builds a phonograph. And they, Edison gets it in two weeks, okay. Well, this is the Thomas Edison of chairs. And he might just be thinking something like, you know, people are going to die if they can't sit down. People can't stand up all day long. Their feet will get real big. They'll, <laughs> they'll pop, they'll, they'll fall down. He just has this idea of people needing rest. And that he has this general idea that they need to put their buttocks down to take the weight off of it. Okay, that's all he says. I need a butt rester. And so he calls one of his nerd angels from downstairs and just says flat out, people got to get off their feet. Invent me butt resters. And then they, they in turn go, oh, wow, I never thought of that idea of a butt rester. Oh, well, we can make millions of different kinds of butt resters. Okay, this Thomas Edison up there on the third floor is an archangel. And an archangel represents huge titanic forces of nature. We could look at gravity as being the archangel, gravity AL. Okay, but he's got angels working for him on the lower floor who's like drop AL or plop. AL or slide or drag or droop AL. You see different aspects of gravity. You follow me? Okay. So that is the Thomas Edison of chairs is up there in Brya, the creative world, the archangelic world of the of the Hebrew Kabbalists. So you got Brya, the creative world, then under that yet Zyra, the formative world of the blueprints, and finally the world of chairs itself. 
but we got one more floor and it's the very top floor and in reality it's the only real floor okay and that's Axeleth, and it's called the archetypal world and let's get in the elevator and go upstairs to the to that floor and the elevator door opens and we don't see anybody because we're so high in the creation cycle here, so high in the consciousness level of deity, that the male and female aspects of deity are still united in bliss. It's that bliss generator you hear so much about in Eastern mysticism, okay? So the male and female aspects of deity are, we can imagine them locked in a, in a blissful and eternal embrace, but maybe one of them says, or one side says, oh, isn't bliss wonderful? Yes, bliss is wonderful. Oh, no, ecstasy is wonderful. Yes, ecstasy. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just stop? Wouldn't it feel good just to stop and we could start our bliss over again? And this abstract, supremely abstract concept of rest, just like the concept of uh, the Hindu concept of pralaya, where every once in a while the universe just takes a rest. That concept of rest inspires that archangel in the floor beneath that Thomas Edison, who gets the idea, a specific idea of rest. People got to get off their feet. And he in turn gives them to the more general angels that make every kind of butt rester on the planet make the, the, the pattern for and eventually it comes down to the material plane. So can you see worlds behind worlds behind worlds? When you look at a chair, you're looking at angels that designed it, an archangel that conceived it, and the abstract concept that inspired it. Those are the four Kabbalistic worlds. And they have an exact counterpart in our own souls. Each of us are running around as that four-story building. Our bodies, our bodies are the lower floor here, okay? And that's called the nepish or the animal soul. And we share that same, same, uh, you know, part of our soul with all sentient beings. And um, it's the part of us that, that makes sure that uh, it's the fight, flight, make sure that we, we eat and, and have sex and. And, uh, but it's also a blind, a blind force, okay? It needs to be controlled by something. And in human beings, the first thing that needs to control that is your intellect. And that's the next part of our soul, okay? That corresponds to those nerd angels in the, in the Kabbalistic world. And that world's called the Ruach, and that's the mind's eye, that's our intelligence. When Grandma knows exactly what the, the Thanksgiving dinner is going to look like and smell like and where everybody's going to sit, she's already got all of that in mind before uh, you know Thanksgiving. She's working on her ruach. Uh, most of us don't even think that there's anything but our ruach. Okay, our ruach has sort of like barricaded itself in our projection room. Okay, and is trying to make us think about everything and try to understand everything with our intellect. It's trying to, it's sort of embarrassed about our nepish, which is like a, you know, a, like a black sheep in the family you don't talk about. But even the higher things, we try to, we try to explain to ourselves through this ruach. Above the ruach is a thing called the neshima. And it's sort of an impossible word to translate, but it kind of means like soul intuition. And this is the, the level of consciousness and the part of our soul that, as mystics, we like to identify with. This is the um, when a mother wakes up in the middle of the night and she knows that Johnny's in trouble. Johnny's just, oh, I know Johnny's in trouble. It's been an accident or something. She wakes up. It doesn't even count as, as psychic phenomena anymore. We know it happens. It's a fact of life. Okay. Did Johnny send mom a message, like a telegraph through the aether, that she picked up and 
and translated, oh, Johnny's just telegraphing me psychically and tells me that he's in trouble. No, that's not the way it happens. Not only that, if Johnny would have been on the other side of the country when that happened, Mom would have picked it up just immediately. And if he'd have been on the moon, Johnny would have gotten that message to Mom, or Mom would have gotten the message. Okay? If Johnny would have been on Alpha Centauri or uh, you know, a million light years away, she would have still got it. And that's because Mom's Neshama, that part of her soul, is so big has no spatial limitations at all. No matter how far Johnny goes, he'll never get out of Mom's Neshama. Same thing with you, your Neshama and my Neshama. We're all walking around, bumping around in each other's Neshama. This is why you can, a magician can see a, a spirit in a triangle, literally see it, and, and it still be inside him. Because of the Neshama, we may as well say there is no outside of ourselves. Because even the things outside of ourselves are within our Neshama. And just above the Neshama, that, uh, that part of our soul that is the reflection of that highest Kabbalistic world, where the, you know, the male and female aspects of Eden used to, okay, is the part of our soul which we may as well just call the life force itself. And that's our true identity. Just like the highest Kabbalistic world was the only real world. The highest part of our soul is called Chai, spelled C-H-I-H. Almost like a chia pet. But it's Chai, like the kind to life. That's our real identity. And that's where every mystic is shooting to be. Okay, we've seen how the, the Kabbalists have divided the spiritual world and the world of the human soul up into these four broad categories that correspond to the letters of the great name yod heh vav -Heh. Four is a fantastically big number. But we can also extend that to absolutely everything else and subdivide into four and subdivide the fours and fours and fours and fours, etc. to look at progressively um, more focused areas of creation. We could uh, we could look at the four fundamental forces of, of physics, the strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force, and gravity. We could we could apply, we could put each one of those in the pigeonhole of Yod Hey Vav -Heh. Same thing with the, the chemical elements of the fiery nitrogen, the watery hydrogen, the airy oxygen, and the very earthy carbon. And speaking of fire, air, earth, and water, the ancients also divided everything and applied that, um, that virtue of those elements to literally everything, fire, water, air, and earth. The Kabbalists, who view numbers as living things, just like scientists that would put uh, a specimen under a microscope, Kabbalists put the number four under a microscope and thought about the number four by, by looking at its component parts. And one of the major ones they came up with was four is one plus two plus three plus four. And all of a sudden equals 10. You put four under a microscope and you see 10. So obviously 10 is a huge, huge number in the Kabbalah. The 10th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Yod, that small single flame. That's the fundamental Hebrew letter. And if you would blow on that single flame, it creates all the other Hebrew letters. And that 10th letter, which has the numeration of 10, because of course in Hebrew, the letters are also numbers, so Yod means 10. Look at this, we've got 10 fingers. We've got 10 fingers. Our hands, which, you know, Yod means hand. Our hands are what separates us from the beasts. 10 is a huge, huge number in the Kabbalah. And when contemplating the universe, 
when contemplating their own souls, the Kabbalists looked for things occurring in nature. They looked for things occurring in logic that has the landmark of Kant. They came up with this incredibly wonderful schematic diagram called the Tree of Life. It's a schematic diagram of the mind of God. And by Kabbalistic logic, it's also a schematic diagram of our own souls. It's not the oldest diagram in, in the Kabbalah. It only goes back to around the 1500s. And while it's not completely satisfactory, uh, you more or less can hang anything that you can possibly think of from uh, matter, energy, consciousness, Anything that you can think of, you can probably find a place on the Tree of Life to hang it. Now, it's that diagram that has ten circles, and those circles are called sephiroth, or emanations. The only real sephiroth is the first one, the top one. It's called kether, it's called the crown, which makes sense. It's the singularity. It's the absolute. It's God beyond which there is no other God. It's God beyond which there is nothing. As a matter of fact, that one did come out of nothing. And the Kabbalists have a concept, a three-part concept, of three kinds of nothing that the one came out of. Even language shows us how this happens. What's bigger than God? Well, nothing's bigger than God. Right. That nothing is a real thing. Okay. What's greater than one? What's more unified than one? What's more powerful than the absolute? Nothing. Right. It came out of nothing. And that nothing, according to the Kabbalah, is a three-part nothing. Ain, Ain Sof, and Ein Sof Or, three inscrutable kinds of nothing out of which one came. Now it's kind of hard in a setting like this to, to actually explain the concept of Ein, Ein Sof and Ein Sof Or, but the Kabbalists do a wonderful, beautiful job, and it gives the Kabbalistic mystic something to shoot for. Because the second to the last thing a Kabbalistic mystic needs to achieve is oneness. Complete identity with the one. That's the second to the last stage of Kabbalistic enlightenment. The very last thing is to identify completely with the nothing. Now I know that sounds all mystical and everything else, and boy it really is all mystical. But let's, let's go back to how this tree of life developed. This tree of life developed to, to show us all of these things we have here. These, these stars, these planets, uh, these galaxies, these, these worlds, these elements, these rocks, these things, this stuff. How did all this stuff come into being from that one? And the tree of life sort of shows us how to do that. The Tree of Life also shows us how to gather up all of our stuff and reclaim the Tree of Life to become the one and then to realize the nothing. Okay, here's how it happened. Uh, imagine that you were deity, that you were the one thing in the entire universe. There's nothing beyond you. You don't even know what you are. You can't hold a mirror up to your to your face and say, oh, that's what I am. There is no outside of you. You can't sit down because all the chairs are inside of you. You're just a big one, okay? How can the one become self-aware? How can the one even know what it is? Why it would want to know, I don't know. And neither do the Kabbalists. Neither do, do any of the, the, the mystics. What, what the motive was for the one to start to think about itself, but it did. And because it couldn't hold a mirror up to itself and look at itself in the face to see what it is, it had to do what the yogis now do, and that is to sit down very quietly and go 
into the center of oneself. And so the one did this, went into the center of oneself till it hit the very, very deepest, deepest, most inscrutable center of its oneness and reflected itself inward. And when it saw what its oneness was by finding its center, it realized, wow, that's what I am. You know, boy, I'm really big, or boy, I'm really small, <laughs> whatever it is, it's the biggest or the smallest of anything in the universe. And it reflected itself, and then created the second condition. One, the crown, created the second condition, two. And in the Kabbalah, that Sephiroth is called Chokmah, or wisdom. But something happened at that exact second that two was created. The third condition was created, and they were born at the same time. Sorry, you just can't have a two without a three. It's one, the reflection. Oh, that's what I am, the one said. Okay, that's what I am. A third condition, the knowledge of, of the self and the not self, and the knowledge that there's a difference between the self and the reflection. Created a third condition, and that third condition on the tree of life is called Bina, or understanding as if, oh, I understand that I'm not the reflection kind of thing. All of this is very, very subtle, and no stuff is being created yet. It just shows us that one cannot even be thought about unless you think about three things. On the Tree of Life, one, two, and three, Kether, Hokma, and Bina are called the supernal triad. And in a sense, it's a reflection of the three kinds of nothing that preceded one. Okay, that's a trinity unit. A supernal triad, one, two, and three, a trinity unit. It really is uh, a way of saying this is what one is. This is the holy trinity of everybody's choice. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Uh, it's the three in one. Well, that trinity unit did the same thing that one did when it reflected into two. A second trinity unit is reflected from that first trinity unit, and it flips, creating the numbers four, five, and six. And the same thing that happened when three was created out of two, the same thing happens on the tree of life and with trinity units, and a third triad is then replicated beneath that, creating um, seven, eight, and nine. It's very, very, very clean now. We've got three trinity units going from one to nine. And the whole thing attempts to start over again, literally grunting itself pinching its eyes to try to replicate that pureness of the one again. And number 10 was formed as a reflection of a reflection of a reflection of the one. And that number 10, Malkuth, the kingdom, is the material plane and human existence. The ancient Kabbalists projected upon the Sephiroth they call planetary spheres. Now they're not quite like the planets themselves, which the Hebrew alphabet takes care of quite nicely, thank you, but planetary spheres as if the quality of the planet was what was being represented, all things martial, all things Jovian, all things solar. Now the ancients, the ancient Hermeticists, in a geocentric world view, saw the world being surrounded by planetary spheres, the spheres of the planets that, that enclose the world like layers of a glass onion. And there were seven planets, including the sun and the moon. Now, even though that we know this is not astrologically correct or astronomically correct, it is still hermetically correct because these seven spheres 
rep represents all things of that quality. And um, on the number one, there were no planets. Okay, that was too inscrutable. As a matter of fact, even number two was too inscrutable to assign a planet to. And, and they assigned the sphere of the fixed stars to. Number three, however, even though it was still the supernal triad, still above this inscrutable abyss that separates the supernal triad, the ideal, from the rest of the tree, the actual. Number three, they assigned to Saturn. Saturn wasn't a god, Saturn was a titan. And Saturn ate his children. And as long as Saturn ate his children, there was no creation, there was no evolution. But once he was tricked with a stone, his wife tricked him and gave him the stone instead of baby Jupiter or baby Jove. The tail came out of the mouth and number four was created. And who is in number four? The god Jupiter, the, the creator god, the Demiurgos. And Jove is just a couple letters off from Jehovah. Okay, both the so-called creator gods. Well, from our point of view, that's about as high as we can see is this creator god. But they order the universe. And all of the other brothers and sisters that were eaten before uh, Jove, they also were thrown up after this uh, uh, event. Uh, and they all came out of Saturn and they all plopped their way down the tree of life in order. Mars for number five. Saul for number six. Venus for number seven. Mercury for number eight. Luna for number nine. And number 10 is the earth itself, almost created as an afterthought of creation. These planetary spheres become very important to Kabbalists once they start their ascent back up the tree of life. Kabbalistic tradition informs us that in the beginning, the creator created heaven and earth and the Creator did so by speaking it into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be pig, and there was pig, but we can't touch. The words that deity spoke by tradition were words in Hebrew, made up of individual Hebrew letters. Now imagine a universe being created by an alphabet. But it's a very, very unique and wonderful alphabet. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet and they're divided into three categories. Three mother letters. Seven double letters that in the beginning had, um, had uh, two ways to pronounce them. And 12 simple letters. Three, seven, and 12 extremely important numbers in the Kabbalah. Numbers that actually created the universe. Now, if we can put ourselves in imagination back to a time before there was creation, where God, deity, the singularity, just brooded in its inscrutable oneness, and something moves it to create. I'd like to create a universe. Well, there really is no space for a universe to be created. So space had to be created first. And so the ancient capitalists speculated that this, this point, this positionless, inscrutable point, stretched itself infinitely and created infinite height. And in doing so, it sealed an infinity of height. And if we can imagine that ceiling uh, is, is if I would reach up and touch the ceiling here and it would create concentric rings going eternally out. out. So that was infinite height. And then it turned below and stretched itself and reached 
infinite depth and seal the infinite depth, just like if I'd reach down and touch the floor. So now we have one thing, a very, very skinny, very, very lanky universe. It's certainly not enough uh, universe uh, to, uh, to put anything in. So it reached to infinite rightness concealed infinite rightness, just like if I would seal this uh, wall over here, and it reached to infinite leftness and touched and sealed, sealed the infinite uh, leftness, just like if I touch this wall. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, we've, we've got, we've got length, okay, and width. Okay, it's a very flat universe. We can't really uh, create very many things yet, because there's no, there's no depth yet. So to do that, deity extended from that central point until it sealed infinite frontness and extended backwards and sealed infinite backness. And what we have is up, down, right, left, forward, and backwards. Now we have the potentiality for space and time. And look at the landmarks that created this infinitely expanding space. Three mothers. Up, down, right, left, and front and back are attributed to the three mother letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And look what we've created with all of those intersecting infinities, top and bottom, right and left, forward and backwards. We create an infinitely expanding cube. And with with the deity as the center and the six faces of this cube expanding infinitely, we have the seven double letters of the Hebrew alphabet. When we look at that cube, we see that there are 12 edges, 12 landmarks of that cube. Three, seven, and 12 created the universe. Games, Kabbalists play. Why do Kabbalists play games with numbers and letters and words and phrases? Why do they do this? They do this to occupy their brains, to occupy themselves long enough to get out of their own way and gain enlightenment. Games Kabbalists play aren't the end. They're the means to an end. And as a matter of fact, don't even think about the end when you play Kabbalistic games. They're just certain kinds of ways to occupy your mind on something that is universal, something that is perfect, something that is gloriously of the reflection of deity but it's just to occupy your mind while you transcend your mind. In other words, you go crazy in a socially acceptable way. And that craziness is really enlightenment. Now, a perfect example of this is what they call the Shemham Fresh, which literally means the divided name. The word Jehovah or yod hey vav hey. It is such a big, big number. It's such a big, big formula in Kabbalah. yod hey vav hey. if we add the letters together, adds to 26. And there's all sorts of ways you can explore yod hey vav hey and explore the number 26. You can play wonderful Kabbalistic games until you just go a little bit bonkers exploring all of these things. Wonderfully bonkers. But 26, there's only so much you can you can discover with 26 before you start getting bored. And somewhere back in the midst of Kabbalistic history, there was a Kabbalistic university where people were more or less encouraged to just think about these things. And so they got a little tired of 26, so somebody said, Okay, you guys, let's look 
hard at yod Hey vav Hey and see if we can look, put it under a microscope and see if we can come up with new numbers, new things that will tell us even more about the details of the nature of deity. And so some smart student came up with the idea, well, let's put it in a little triangle. Let's put Yod, then yod Hey on the next line, and then yod Hey vav and then on the next line, yod Hey vav Hey. So it's Yod, yod Hey, yod Hey vav yod Hey vav Hey Ragma. That's the old song. Then. then when they did that, they added the total of the, the letters and they came up with this number 72. Now 72 is kind of an interesting number because it represents to an astrologer anyway, 72 periods of five degrees that more or less pinpoint where anything is on any given day of the year. So in other words, if they could find find some way to connect 72 with yod Hey vav Hey, 72 with Jehovah, then they would know which component part of Jehovah rules any given day. This is a wonderful, wonderful, provocative kind of idea. And so they set to work to find out what is the 72-fold name of God. And so I don't know whether it was for monastic punishment or, or whatever reason, but they gave some poor soul the job of counting every Hebrew letter in every verse of the holy books of the Bible, the book of the law, the five books, the Pentateuch. And this, whoever it was, start, went to work, counted every, uh, every verse, and finally he gets to three consecutive verses in the book of Exodus that have 72 letters each. Three consecutive verses with 72 letters each. Now this was impressive and probably impressed their, their teachers a, a great deal. But it might not have been so impressive if the verses that these 72 letters appeared in were probably the most recognizable, most memorable books in the entire, or verses in the entire Old Testament. Now, who could forget Charlton Heston standing up on a rock, separating the waters of the Red Sea so the, the children of Israel can pass through safely while the Egyptians get, get drowned? That's what's talked about in those three verses. Remember, he goes, Behold his mighty hand! Okay, and that's almost like saying, behold, some Kabbalistic knowledge in these two things, you know, okay, or these three things. And, and so what they did was they, they wrote those three verses like a snake, okay? They wrote the first verse with 72 letters as, as is done in Hebrew from right to left. Then the second, the, the second verse of these, these three verses, they wrote right underneath going from, from left to right, and then the last verse from right to left again. And then they looked at these letters in 72 columns and read the 72-fold name of God. Pretty impressive, okay? So instead of saying yod heh vav -Hey, which they don't say yod heh vav -Hey, the 72-fold name of God would be pronounced, well, you'd have to really take a real big breath in order to, to actually say that. But each one of those, okay, then they allotted that. They allotted each of those sections, okay, to five degrees of the zodiac. Hey, not only that, but there's 72 fold names of God. But if they added an IH, or an AL to the end of those three letters, they created an angel, an angel of the Shemhamfurish, that is the executor of that particular facet of yod heh vav -Hey that rules days of the year. It's so beautiful. Oh, not only that, but 
but uh, uh, you see it wonderfully exhibited in the structure of the tarot where the 36 small cards, the twos through nines of each of the four suits, are laid out perfectly along the lines of the angels of the Shemhamfarish. And those, of course, represent the, the, the four Kabbalistic worlds that descend. Okay, you can get it all the way down to the demons of the Goetia, the day and night spirits of the Solomonic magic. The reason I'm even going through all of this is to show you how one thing leads to another, leads to another, is connected to another. You can dissect things down into madness. Wonderful madness. And somewhere along the line, on these games that Kabbalists play, your Ruach, remember the intellect, finally gets overloaded and it just sort of gives up and sees the connection of everything in the universe, everything in heaven and earth connected to everything else in heaven and earth. And in the afterglow, in the ecstasy of that realization that looking at one thing is in absolute essence looking at everything else and that, that it's all connected is the Kabbalistic illumination. Now that we've seen how the Tree of Life is constructed and how the invisible has become visible down here in the world of Ten, now that we know that it is our mystical duty, our personal spiritual duty, to climb back up the Tree of Life and eventually gain union with Godhead. How do we go about that? The Kabbalah has many techniques and a wealth of traditional literature that symbolically give us hints on how this is done. But the simplest way to explain it is to look at a Tree of Life, just like you've drawn here, and to turn it into a Kabbalistic fairy tale. A fairy tale that is very, very uh, familiar to all of us. But let's say that in this fairy tale we have a king, a queen, a prince, and a princess. And the king is Yod, the queen is He, the prince is Vav, and the princess is the He final. Us. We're the princess. But the king lives right here. And if we would put it on the Tree of Life here, let's say the king lives in number two, because the king had to come from somewhere too. So let's just say the king is number two, and his queen is number three. Okay. When the king and queen get together and make love, their ecstasy annihilates their separate personalities and they become one. That's amazing. But how do we get in on that act? Let's go back to the tree of life here. So there's the King Yod, Queen He. Now, when the king and queen make love, she becomes pregnant with twins, a prince and a princess and they both plop out below the abyss. The prince, however, plops out a little higher than the princess. The prince's kingdom, or the principality, is Sephiroth 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. But he sets up his headquarters, really, in number 6. That's, that's really the core of who the prince is. And the princess, finally, poor princess, a final is down here in number 10 where we live. Okay. The princess has amnesia. She doesn't even remember that she has a brother, a prince, or that they're both the children of a queen and a king. As a matter of fact, the princess is totally oblivious. She thinks she's caught up in an endless loop of, of karmic soap operas, 
not knowing that there is a wonderful, wonderful spiritual heritage just above her. If she could only meet the prince, and if the prince could only kiss her, something wonderful would happen. You know, the prince over here, living in, in, in Vav here, it's, it's pretty high and everything else, but you know, he'll never be king unless he takes a bride. And that bride is us. So, in the spiritual fairy tale of the Kabbalah, each of us has a prince. We call it the Holy Guardian Angel. It's a terrible term, but it's a close as we can possibly get to actually describing what it is. It is our self perfected, but it's even more than that. It's a spiritual entity that we have to mate with. It's the goal, it's the lover of every ecstatic mystic that ever walked the face of the earth. He's Christ to the Christians. He's Krishna to the Hindus. Ultimately, he's us. But until he kisses us, like we're a sleeping beauty, until he smashes that casket of matter that we're trapped in and presses those mad lips to ours and we realize we wake up. Until then, we're still stuck in this prison of matter. So the first job in our path of return is to have the prince kiss us. Not only that, but once the prince awakens us and we kind of know who we are and what our birthright is, the prince makes love to us and we become pregnant, making us a queen, making him a king. And the whole thing returns. It sounds like a bit of an incestuous relationship, but it's a divinely incestuous relationship because ultimately we're making love only with ourselves, but with ourselves as God. That's the path of return. And that's the basic fairy tale, secret of the Holy Kabbalah. Obviously, this has been just the briefest overview of some very basic Kabbalistic principles. Kabbalah is a lifetime endeavor. Even if you only know a few little Kabbalistic principles, all of a sudden, that is your Kabbalah. My Kabbalah will never be your Kabbalah. Your Kabbalah will never be anybody else's. If you only know three Hebrew letters and what they mean, that's your Kabbalah. It's been planted in you and it'll grow. If you are truly interested in continuing your Kabbalistic studies, there's more than enough information published today, more than at any other time in history. And it's a wonderful and rewarding endeavor. So I thank you very much for spending this much time with me. And Shalom.